So gonna talk overall virtual networks. So the first thing I guess to really focus on is, well, what is a virtual network? And when we think about Azure as that kind of public cloud, we always create things in a subscription. So our first kind of layer is obviously we have an Azure sub. And that subscription has kind of certain boundaries to it. And then within a certain subscription, we can use one or more regions. A region is defined as that two millisecond latency envelope. And so I have multiple facilities within there. And that's where we think about using capacity. The cloud is really capacity that's exposed through various services. And so within the subscription, I can use one or more regions. So I have a particular region that I'm going to use for what I want to do. So within a region, I can go ahead and I can create a virtual network. So the, the key point about this is a virtual network exists within a subscription within a region. It cannot span subscriptions, it cannot span regions. So if I have multiple subscriptions, if I have uh, multiple regions, I'm going to have a VNet minimum per region per subscription. So I may end up with lots of them. You have a virtual network, the virtual network exists within a certain region, a certain subscription. Now that virtual network is just made up of one or more IPv4 CIDR ranges. Uh, I can have more than one. It doesn't have to just be RFC 1918, like the 10.172, whatever. I could actually bring my own IP space uh, with me actually to that. And I can have multiples. I could have a 10 dot, I could have a 172.16, a 192.168, all within the same virtual network. So I can make my virtual network up of multiple IPv4 spaces. Uh, I can optionally have IPv6 ranges added to it as well. I don't have to, but I can dual stack. So a virtual network does support both IPv4 and IPv6. Now, within that virtual network, I actually break it up just like any regular network. I think about it, I break it up into subnets. So I can create multiple subnets that each are going to use a portion of the IP space. So I can have kind of sub one, um, sub two, three, four, etc. So they're a portion of that IPv4, that IPv6 space. Now, I do lose five IP addresses um, from every subnet I create. So you always use kind of the all zeros, the all ones for the network address and kind of the network broadcast. But you also lose the first usable IP address for the Azure Gateway and then the next two for the mapping of Azure DNS IP addresses. So any subnet you create, you're going to lose five IP addresses, two for the protocol, uh, three for Azure purposes. A key point is as well, when I, when I talk about a region, well, a region is actually made up of multiple facilities. Uh, sometimes you'll see them talked about as availability zones. So I might have multiple availability zones actually making up that region, which is AZ1, AZ2. Virtual networks, subnets span availability zones. They're not pinned to any particular availability zone. So I don't have to think about, well, I've got this subnet for AZ1, uh, this subnet for AZ2. They don't care. They're all regional constructs. If I wanted to have a particular subnet tied to a particular AZ, I would just have to take care of that when I think about placing my objects. Okay, I, I want this subnet just for AZ1, well, I need to make sure I only put things in AZ1 into that subnet. Now, why you might want to do that is there are some zonal type resources in Azure. Zonal means it's within a certain zone. Like NAT Gateway can be deployed regionally or zonally. So if I was going to use NAT Gateway and I pinned a NAT Gateway to zone one, I wouldn't want resources in zone two using a NAT Gateway in zone one. Now I've done a cross zone dependency, it's saying happened to zone one, even though my VMs are still in a different zone, they now can't get to the internet. So that's why sometimes I might want to pin things to a certain zone, but I can't do that natively just few subnets. Uh, 
I would have to logically make sure how I'm actually placing stuff uh, to make that happen. So I think about, I have kind of all these subnets, they're all within this region, and essentially I create resources. Now, I don't really put resources in a subnet. I mean, really the way it works is I think about, okay, I, I can create a virtual machine. So let's say I, I create a VM. That VM actually has a network adapter and it's the network adapter that I connect to a particular subnet uh, in a particular virtual network. So essentially at that point, that virtual machine gets an IP address from that subnet. And for the virtual machine, it always thinks DHCP. So it's gonna get its IP address by basically shouting out, hey, can someone give me an IP address? And Azure essentially acts as that DHCP service and will give it an IP address. Now, if I need it to have the same IP address, even if it's deprovisioned, I uh, stop paying for it and then create it again. Maybe it's a SQL server, maybe it's a domain controller. I can do that. I can essentially do reservations at the Azure Fabric level, but the VM itself is always using DHCP. There's one exception. If I get into like multiple IP configurations, which is possible on a NIC, then I have to go and do some other types of config. But again, that, that's the edge case. All the other cases, I'm gonna let it use DHCP and get that address config actually from the Azure Fabric that will go and offer it an available IP address. Now, obviously this, this is the Azure virtual network. And then sitting outside of this, I can think about, well, I've kind of got the internet. So I've got this internet thing out here. What, what's the communication between the things? And the reality is I can actually get to the internet. There's no special DMZ network. There's no special thing I have to do. By default, resources on a virtual network can talk to the internet. Now it is stateful. Um, yes, I can go outbound to the internet. So if I'm on this virtual machine, I could absolutely go and talk to some kind of internet service and I can get the response back. But I can't just offer services out to the internet. Uh, I, I have no way of actually offering things out by default. Now the actual nature of how this talks to the internet does completely vary. If I'm a, for example, a virtual machine or a scale set, it doesn't really matter, they're all built on the same thing. If I have something called an instance level public IP, so I can actually allocate a public IP to a virtual machine. If I was to do that, if I actually gave it its own public IP, don't really recommend this, but you can, then it would use that to actually go and talk to the internet. So if resources on the internet would see that instance level public IP. Now the VM doesn't know it has an instance level public IP. It's the Azure Fabric. Hey, when it gets things to that public IP, it will kind of go and pass it through. If a VM doesn't have an instance level public IP, then it kind of varies. Now, if that virtual machine maybe is part of a load balancer, so it's part of kind of a back-end set. So a load balancer, we have traffic coming in, it hashes it and distributes it to members of a back-end pool. Uh, might have 10 web servers, they're behind a back-end set to balance the traffic. So in that scenario, hey, if this is a member of kind of that back-end pool, if this was a just regular, the free Azure load balancer, whether it had a public IP or not, if it doesn't have a public IP, one kind of gets allocated and it will do source and port address translation and go out via the public IP of the load balancer. Now, if it's a standard load balancer, then it would have to be an external type. If it was an internal standard load balancer, i.e. it doesn't have a public IP, the VMs behind it would not be able to get to the internet. They'd have no path. A standard load balancer won't just automatically um, spin up a public IP and let the VMs access the internet. I would have to either go and add another standard load balancer of public type of a public IP, then they would use that to get to the internet, or I could use NAT Gateway. NAT Gateway is a pure NAT service, network address translation. 
the NAT gateway has public IPs or public IP prefixes, i.e. more than one, so then you don't have the risk of kind of port exhaustion doing uh, the port mapping. So I could absolutely have a load balancer to balance traffic kind of coming in and have a NAT gateway on the subnet for the outbound internet traffic. So I would, I would have to do something specific, either a separate load balancer with an external IP or add a NAT gateway. So that's me kind of talking out to the internet. And really it's the same constructs if I want to receive. If I want to offer a service out to the internet, we want to be really careful with this. Um, but let's say I want to offer 443. Yeah, I could use that instance level public IP again. I could say, hey, VM1, you have a public IP. You could offer 443 on that and you'll get the traffic. You don't really want to do that. So what we want to use is a load balancer. Now the regular load balancer is a layer four. So to be like kind of TCP, uh, UDP, it's going to have the traffic come in and then it will distribute it a five, three or two tuple. So five tuple means it's going to look at the source uh, IP and port, the destination IP and port and the protocol. And it will generate a hash from that and then send it to one of the back end set members. What that guarantees is as long as the source IP and port and the destination IP and port and the protocol are the same, it always goes to the same back end set member. If that's maybe too specific, maybe the ports change, for example, then I can change it to kind of three tuple. Just as long as the source IP and the destination IP and the protocol is the same, the port can change. It will go to the same back end set member. Two tuple, just the IPs. As long as the source IP and the destination IP is the same, it will go to the same back end set member. So we can do that layer four. That's how we want to offer services out to the internet. Or we have things like App Gateway. So App Gateway, that's a layer seven. So layer seven means it understands things like HTTP. I can do things like SSL offload. I can do things like cookie-based affinity. I can add things like a web application firewall, WAF in front of it, to help protect from things like a SQL injection attack, common types of attack. So as the traffic's coming in, I can check the traffic and then just like a load balancer, I can have backend members to distribute those incoming requests from. So that's how I can think about, hey, if I want to just talk to the internet, most of the time it's going to just happen for me. Special scenarios are if I'm behind an internal standard load balancer, I have to do something specific, or maybe I just want to be able to control it anyway. I want to know what public IP services I'm talking to are going to come from. So maybe I can whitelist. So then, hey, I can add a standard load balancer of a public IP or use NAT gateway. I'll know exactly what IPs will be used. If I want to offer services to the internet, then typically we'll use a standard load balancer of a public IP uh, or I can use app gateway. So that's talking to the internet. And again, don't open things like RDP or SSH or WinOM to the internet. It's a good way to uh, test how good your passwords are. You're only gonna open up things that you actually want to offer. Typically, it's gonna be over 443, uh, some kind of web-based service. So, okay, we have a virtual network. It's in a region, great. And we talked about there are these boundaries, subscriptions, regions. So I may end up with more than one virtual network. I may have another virtual network over here, another one over here. And I've got resources deployed to them and they want to talk. Now, there used to be all these different ways of connecting things. Say, I'd use a site to site VPN, I could connect them to the same express route circuit. Um, we don't really want to use any of those. Site to site VPN, well, I kind of get bottlenecked based on the performance of the gateway. Express route, the traffic has to bounce via the meet me. So what we're gonna use is express um, network peering. So with network peering, essentially I create this peering relationship between the virtual networks. It's on the Azure backbone. They can be in different regions, different subscriptions, different tenants even. And now I'm essentially connecting them. Now there cannot be an IP space overlap. If this is using the same IP space as this, I cannot peer them together. 
because essentially they're going to advertise the spaces so it can do routing between them. But providing they're not, AI I can do this great network peering capability. And now they can just talk. Now they cannot talk to each other. Network peering is not transitive. If I want these two kind of spokes to talk, well, I have to add a peering relationship. So if I have a lot of um, virtual networks, I may end up with quite a big mesh. They all have to have a connection to each other. So an alternate approach, if kind of I have so many, and when Aiden talks about virtual WAN, it kind of does this for us, one of the options I could do is deploy something like well, maybe Azure Firewall, or I could do a network virtual appliance. And essentially, if you think that this is maybe IP space uh, A, and this is IP space B, what I can do is say, hey, look, I can have a route table, so use it to find routing. On this VNet, I can say, hey, look, if you want to talk to IP space A, well, your next hop is IP C, the IP address of that Azure Firewall. In this VNet, I could say, hey, look, if you want to talk to IP space B, you have to talk to IP C, the firewall. And then it will kind of enable those to talk to each other. It has to have forwarding enabled, but it will facilitate different spokes to essentially talk to each other. And again, when Aiden talks about virtual WAN, it, it does that, it enables that transitive nature for the virtual networks uh, for you kind of automatically. So that, that's great, uh, VNets can talk to each other. Most likely, you also kind of have on-premises stuff. So you've got an on-premises data center, and I, I want to talk to things in my virtual networks. We have a number of different options for this. Now, I can do things like a site-to-site -site VPN. I can do a point-to-site. I can essentially, via the internet, um, gateways are stood up in a gateway subnet. So one of these would be a special subnet. So let's say this is the gateway subnet. And it will deploy using scale sets now, uh, multiple virtual gateways that would facilitate site to site VPN or point to site VPN. So the communication is going via the internet. It can do be pretty big now. I think the biggest one is 10 gigabits per second. So I can, I can do very large amounts of bandwidth. It's going to use uh, both policy and route based. So depending on the capabilities of my local gateway, it will depend on, well, does it have to be a static config or can it actually dynamically um, do the route exchange? It will use IPsec, so Ike, um, to actually do the encryption over the internet. And I establish a tunnel. So then I can go and talk to stuff in Azure. But it is going over the internet. Latency, who knows? Um, it's going over the internet. It's going to vary. So the other option a lot of enterprises will look at is Express Route. Now I, I drew the idea of a region and I had this virtual network. But what I can really think about is that Azure has this massive global backbone. So there's this Microsoft network. And what essentially is happening is for every region, I can actually think about, well, there are these kind of regional network gateways. You have this pair of regional network gateways that go and kind of connect to all the different buildings um, that make up that region. And those regional network gateways kind of go and actually connect to that Microsoft backbone. So they're what provide that connectivity. So there's this huge network, um, Microsoft 365, Dynamics, Azure, all use this great big backbone. They're dropping their own cables under the Atlantic. They've got submarines. They run this massive network. So the regions obviously hang off of that network. But there's also other edges off of this network. You'll hear them kind of, the, you have these edge nodes that hang off, things like the content delivery network, um, these various points of presence. But what they also do is you have these kind of carrier neutral facilities. You might hear them called meet me points. And so at these meet me's, these carrier neutral facilities, Microsoft also extends their network. So they have their own kind of cage, their own DMARC within that facility. 
and you can essentially meet them from your network. Now there's different models of how you can do that. One of them might be, well I actually just drop fiber. I drop cables into that meet me and they cross connect them. And essentially now I've connected my network to that Azure backbone. Or maybe I had an existing kind of MPLS, uh, an AVPN, whatever, that I'm connected to, and I can connect that MPLS via one of these facilities to get onto the network. Whichever one I'm picking, essentially this is ExpressRoute. So it's the idea of taking my network and connecting it to the Microsoft Backbone Network. I've not connected to a particular region, I've not connected to a particular service. All I've done with Express Route at this point is essentially connected my network. To actually go and get to a virtual network, I have to enable something else. So we have the circuit. Over that circuit, I'm gonna do something called private peering. So with private peering, what I'm essentially doing is, hey, from my, my network here, I have edge routers in that carrier neutral facility. They're cross-connecting to the Microsoft Enterprise Edge. And then over those physical connections, I'm gonna establish private peering. So it's actually gonna to go to that gateway subnet where I have these virtual gateway appliances. So I can do sort of BGP sessions, so I can actually share the routing. So here, this is private peering. So I'm connecting the IP space of my on-premises, so maybe this is IP space D, that can't overlap again. They have to be unique IP spaces. So I'm now connecting this IP space over private peering to the IP space of that virtual network. Got those gateways, I can now just talk through those various services. And I can connect multiple virtual networks to the same circuit. So this is what we were talking about. Technically, I could have gateways over here. I could have a gateway connecting to the same circuit, which is based in this meet me. The circuit is based on the meet me. So then resources in this VNet could talk to resources in this VNet. But the traffic flows via the meet me location. So yes, I could connect this VNet to the same circuit, but if a VM here wanted to talk to a VM here, the traffic flow would be, well, down, down to the meet me, hairpinned, so turned around, and then back over to talk to the VM there. So I'm constantly traversing that meet me. So my latency would be whatever the latency is between the VNet and the meet me, and then whatever the latency is between that VNet and the meet me. So if these were the same region, they could be facing each other in the data center, but the traffic would still hairpin via the meet me. Whereas if I use network peering, it just stays on the Azure backbone. It's gonna be by far the, the fastest experience for that. If this was in another region completely, again, it's still having to hairpin via that meet me location. Now for resiliency purposes, if these were other regions and I had maybe multiple facilities, Normally what I would have is two circuits. So I would have this would have its own kind of, um, it would use a meet me here. I would have the gateway connected. So I'd essentially have another set of express route kind of peering over to this one here. So it has a more efficient path. So I'm going to a meet me closer to that region. But for resilience sake, what I would often do is actually connect this network to this circuit as well, but it would be less weighted, so it wouldn't want to use it. Likewise, I can use things like path prepending to say, hey, no, no, uh, go this route when I want to talk to Azure. But if this went down for some reason, now I can have kind of a secondary path I can use if my primary is not available. Now that, that's a much more complicated thing. Uh, if you're interested in that, I did like an hour and a half of deep dive on Express Routes on my YouTube channel. So I go into all the details about waiting and ASN path prepending that I can use to kind of drive and control how I would actually have resiliency in that express route. But essentially, I'm going to remove that line. Express route is really a, uh, about connecting me to the backbone. Once I'm on that backbone, 
then I can do private peering to resources to virtual networks in any region in that geopolitical boundary. So my Meet Me has no real affinity to any particular region over another. If I'm in North America, I can connect to East US, West US, Canada, it doesn't matter. I can't connect to Europe unless I do premium. So Express Route Premium lets me not worry about the geopolitical boundary and just let me use connect to any of the regions. Again, latency is going to be big at that point, but it would let me do it. So I do have that option available. Now, what about these spokes hanging out over here? I said yes, I could attach multiple express route gateways and multiple VNets to the same circuit. But I have to pay for those gateways. There, there's management I have to do there. So one of the things I can actually do is actually on these VNets, there's a configuration to use remote uh, gateway and allow, allow uh, gateway transit. So what would now happen is these VNets, their IP space, would now get included as part of the kind of the BGP conversation. It would know about the IP spaces. So now they can actually talk to on-premises via this. So this really becomes a hub. These are spokes. And these will use the remote gateway of this virtual network. And these are going to allow gateway transit to allow it to go to these other peered virtual networks. So now I'm totally enabling kind of a flow that, hey, uh, well, this can actually talk via the peer, via the gateway, um, to on-premises. Uh, that's a very common configuration. And again, when you talk about virtual WAN, it's going to be doing those things for you. So it's all going to kind of build on this. That's great. Um, this is all about enabling communication. What about if I don't want things to communicate? So the next thing I can kind of do is if I think about for a second, I had those multiple kind of subnets. So they're all within kind of this virtual network. But I've got kind of my subnet one, subnet two, and subnet three. What I can use is something called network security groups. Network security groups enable me to define based on kind of um, source side arranges, um, destination side arranges. I can say ports, and then kind of an action, kind of allow, block, and priority. So what I could pretty easily do is I could say, hey, look, using these rules, this subnet based on its IP range, yeah, sure, you are allowed to receive traffic on 443 from the internet. And then, sure, you're allowed to talk over certain ports to subnet two. Two, and maybe that's a database back end, you can use 1433, sure you're good, but you are not allowed to talk directly. You are not allowed to talk to the internet. So network security groups enable me to control how the packets can flow. It is not an edge device. I create these rules, I apply them at a subnet level for manageability purposes. So I create this NSG, I apply it at the subnet level. It is not enforced at the edge. It is not an appliance. Essentially, what's happening is you can think there's Hyper-V hosts underneath. The Hyper-V hosts have a virtual switch. That virtual switch has a virtual filtering platform where all the NICs that actually are connected to the VMs flow the traffic through. It's here in the virtual filtering platform these rules are actually enforced. So if I assign it at a subnet or at a NIC level, they're enforced at the same place. So there's zero point in having rules at the subnet and the NIC. You're just doing the same set of rules twice. It's not an edge device. It's enforced at the switch level as the traffic is flowing through it. But with this, I can now completely control the flow of traffic based on those IP addresses. Now that's fantastic. But, well, what about if there's Azure services? There's things like Azure Storage. There's maybe Azure SQL Database. And I want to control the flow to those. Now, all of these services are essentially advertising over a whole bunch of public IPs. And there's a lot of them. There's huge ranges of IPs. 
um, specific to regions, specific to services. I'm not going to try and add all those IP addresses into some destination rules. So instead of doing a side arrange, I can also do something called a service tag. So a service tag are basically provided by Microsoft for the services. So when I create an NSG, I'll actually see an option. And if we jump over really quick, and let's have a look. So if I was to go and look over here, and if I look at my network security groups, I'll just pick one, doesn't really matter. If I look at, for example, my outbound rules, and I add a rule, we can see here sort of destination, I can do an IP address, or I can do these kind of service tags. So if I select service tag, we'll then see things like the internet. So the internet is all IP space that's not known to the virtual network. Virtual network is the virtual network's IP space and any connected network to that virtual network. Azure Load Balancer is the Azure Load Balancing services, but then we see all these other services. So I can see things like, well, there's storage, there's SQL, and at regional levels. So what these do is essentially map to the public IP addresses of those services for those regions. So I could now add those rules as part of my actual configuration. So now I can use those service tags actually as part of my rules. So I say, hey, yeah, you're allowed to go and use storage in East US. So I can control that flow, say yes, only to those. So that helps me talk to Azure services based on region. Again, the flow of what I can use. Now, sometimes IP address ranges are, are not going to be very useful for me because maybe I have resources scattered over subnets, trying to work out the right side of range for this group of services just doesn't map. So the other thing I can also use is something called an application security group. An application security group is really a tag. If I think about that virtual machine resource, and that virtual machine resource essentially, remember, has a NIC, so it has that network interface card. An ASG is a tag. I can basically tag this with you are a SQL VM. So I can add multiple of these app security group tags to a NIC. So now it will actually say, it doesn't matter what IP range, I can just say, hey, look, uh, if you're an IIS VM, you're allowed to talk to SQL VMs. And I'm done. I don't have to really worry about where the actual VM is in terms of CIDR range. And again, that's just a property on the NIC itself. So back over here, you saw I had that app security group option here, and I'll see any app security groups I've got. So I have quarantine. Quarantine's super useful for maybe something's wrong with the VM. I can slap it with a quarantine tag and then my rules could say, hey, I'm going to block you from doing anything unless you're talking to something in the remediation subnet. But at a virtual machine level, if I just go and look at some virtual machine, doesn't really matter what one, and I look at the networking, I can see I have my network interface, and then I have application security groups. So here I could go and actually slap on a certain tag that I've defined. I could create new ones. And that's how I can assign them to the NIC itself. And it can now be used as part of those NSG rules. So that's another option for how I can control the flow of traffic. And when I'm really thinking about things uh, within my virtual network. What about the other way? What about if I have, hey, I've got my resources here. And I want to say I only want this particular instance of storage to be able to be spoken to from things in this particular subnet. So what we have to do then is something called service endpoints. So I can kind of say, hey, for this particular subnet, I'm labeling a service endpoint for SQL and storage, whatever else. And this does two things. If I've enabled it for storage, or SQL, whatever I've done, 
on the firewall configuration now of that type of resource, on its firewall rule, I can now say on that firewall will only allow subnet 2. So it's at a particular instance, it now knows about this subnet and it will allow me as part of its firewall to say, hey, only allow stuff from that particular subnet. That's one thing it does. The second thing it does is it actually also now adds an optimal route to that service. So even though it's still using the public IP, instead of it kind of bouncing around, it doesn't go out to the internet, but instead of it bouncing around kind of the regular routing path uh, within Azure to get to it, it actually establishes a new type of route directly to that service. If we actually went and looked, I'll have to try and remember um, an example, but if I go back to this kind of virtual machine and we're looking at kind of the networking, I can see, if I can remember where that actually is, there's an option, let's look at the NIC. I can see effective routes down here on the bottom. And if I look at the effect, actually that's not a good example, let me go to a different VM quick because I want one in South Central. If I go to this one and look at its NIC and look at my effective routes, this shows me all the routes that the subnet's on knows about. And I've got some service endpoints defined on here. So what I'll see for a group of IP addresses I'll see these special types. So I've got some peering set up so I can see the type of next hop for peering down here. But then you'll also see these virtual network service endpoints. Now these IP ranges here actually map to different services that I've enabled service endpoints on for various subnets in that virtual network. So different storage services in different regions, different Azure SQL database. So now it has a different hop type for those. So it's going to have a more optimal route to actually get to them. So that's kind of the other change it makes. Yes, on the firewall now for that service, I can now allow access just to stuff in that subnet, but also now I'm going to have a better route to it. Uh, there's also something called service endpoint policies. Service endpoint policies let me basically stop data exfiltration because what it lets me do is on this subnet, I can say, hey, you're only allowed to talk to instance two of storage account and no others. So I can't get stuff and copy it somewhere else. So it's a data exfiltration technology. The other big thing, so that's one option. Hey, I can use service endpoints, but it still has public IPs. Now service endpoints are super secure. I'm locking it down the firewall, I'm good. But the other thing I can do is something called private endpoints. So here, maybe I've got uh, another storage account or SQL or Cosmos. Pretty much all of them support this. What I can now do is essentially create a private endpoint. Now that private endpoint, I can't draw, a private endpoint is an IP address from that subnet's IP range. So it doesn't look like really anything particularly special. It's just an IP address in that subnet. But it now maps to that particular instance of SQL. It's not generic to all of them. This is SQL instance one. So now when I talk to that private endpoint IP address, and I can get to that private IP address from anything connected. So if I had express route as well, I could get to that private endpoint IP. Service endpoints I can't. Service endpoints only work if you're in that subnet. If I wanted to use it from this subnet, I'd have to add another service endpoint. But this is just an IP address. If I can get to the IP and I have the right DNS record, there's special DNS records required for a private zone, I now talk to that instance. I can completely turn off the public IP. It's gonna now give me that ability to get to just that instance. Now, network security group rules do not apply to a private endpoint today. But now, by only having these private endpoint IPs, I can essentially lock out anything else. I can also use it in another way. Imagine I had another virtual network. Now, I talked about for peering, 
they have to have unique IP ranges or I can't connect them. What if they're the same IP range? Or maybe they would be, or I just don't want to peer them. If I have my own custom service running in here, I have like a load balancer to make it available. I can add private link service. And from here, I can project a private endpoint into another virtual network. The huge thing it does though, is it NATs the traffic. So these could have exactly the same IP ranges, they're overlapping, it doesn't matter. The private link service is going to actually do natting of that traffic. So now I can advertise traffic in loads of different virtual networks, it doesn't matter about what the IP address ranges are, it's just going to support that. So that's why you'll hear a lot about private endpoints. Yes, it's great for Azure services, um, I can make them available very, very um, easily now without worrying about public IP addresses, really lock that down. But also for my own custom services or service providers, they can now present IP addresses um, into other virtual networks as well. So I'm, I'm at like five minutes. There's other stuff I was going to cover, but for, for time I won't. Um, uh, are there any questions about stuff I've covered um, that you want me to quickly clarify? I know there's like four minutes left. Okay, I guess I can see if there's any questions.